Innovation Teaching Learning Series. We actually launched this series as part of a Diet Seed Fund in the early February. This is actually our fourth series for the year. Uh, and we have had a exciting lineup of speakers. And today we're privileged to have another exciting speaker from the State of University of New York. Uh, and for those that can see in the background, Alex, welcome, Alex. And I know that uh, the time difference is quite uh, uh, with New York and South Africa, six hours behind, but you're still up and early joining us today. So thank you very much for that. Um, colleagues at this time, uh, thank you for all those that are from inside UNISA that have joined us, uh, academic staff, as well, I see there are a lot of members from outside from other universities that have also joined us. So thank you very much for joining us today and also supporting the Academic Development Open Virtual Lab. Uh, and we look forward for a very nice two hours engaging conversation around the issue of teaching online. Um, I had the privilege of speaking to Alex yesterday and we had quite a quite a good one hour discussion on uh, on developments at the State University of New York, but particularly how that can benefit us at the University of South Africa and in our South African context as well. And Alex has an abundance of knowledge which we hope to tap into. Uh, and I should also state that the, the State University of New York SUNY is not new to UNISA. Uh, we've actually had some links with uh, SUNY University uh, and uh, Alex has actually been behind those links as well for those of you that are aware of the signature causes uh, and some of the other developments. So thank you once again Alex for joining us and for agreeing to share your wisdom with us on this specific topic which is highly highly pertinent for us in the South African context. Uh, it's also my privilege to have Professor Opa Sheila with us who is the Executive Director uh, the, for the Department of Tuition Support and Facilitation of Learning. He is also the project owner for our sponsor of this event, which is the Student Support in 4R uh, Readiness in an Open Distance E-Learning Environment, which is a DA project. And at this time, I'd like to take this opportunity to invite Professor Mashida to officially welcome you, provide some context and welcome you to uh, the session. Uh, Prof Mashida, welcome and let me end over to you. Uh, good uh, afternoon, uh, program director and uh, our uh, esteemed uh, speaker. Um, let me take this uh, opportunity to uh, to welcome you all. Um, as part of the University of South Africa's 2016 to 2030 institutional strategy, uh, its first strategic focus area emphasizes the need for accelerating the shift towards becoming a leading African comprehensive ODL university in teaching and learning, research, innovation, and community engagement based on, on scholarship. Uh, given the rate of advancement uh, with new technologies in the fourth industrial revolution, UNISA runs the risk of being overtaken by the speed of these developments. One of the critical performance areas impacted by the pace of technology advancements in teaching and learning, um, it has resulted in new innovative ways for delivering teaching and engaging learning processes among our students. Online teaching and learning requires different types of skills, including pedagogical, technical, communication and collaborative skills that may not match those that lecturers are familiar with. As technologies advance, uh, as technologies advanced during the pandemic, the style and the scope of teaching and learning also had to change. Academics were now forced to embrace new methods of teaching um, using uh, technology. They were forced to rethink their content and curriculum design, uh, making certain that there is uh, flexibility. Academics also had to rethink the notion of quality as it uh, relates to the online uh, space. Added to the above is the question of whether the institution is ready, um, either from uh, the ICT infrastructure or 
all other kinds of preparedness that is required. required. Um, and so the question of whether the institution is ready uh, to also provide the academics with the tools uh, that is necessary in operating in the online space. And so the Academic Development Open Virtual Hub was set up through um, our Ministry of Education's uh, funding, uh, seed funding. Um, the main aim of the ADVO project is to build the academic competencies of both staff and students as we transition to an online delivery of teaching and learning. The ADVO is an innovation in teaching and learning service. Um, and this we launched as the program director indicated in February 2021. The main aim of this service is to create a virtual platform in which we could engage with leading specialists and experts in teaching and learning, both nationally and internationally. This will help us, we think, as an institution to benchmark ourselves against international trends and standards while reflecting on our own context. As part of this series, we have already hosted uh, six experts on the following topics on mobile and seamless learning, hybrid education, looking at when learning device boundary challenges conventions, we looked at uh, open pedagogies for a digital era, becoming more open, alternative approaches to continuous professional development for university academics and librarians. We looked also at rethinking academic development in an era of crisis and innovation. In today's session, uh, we are looking at rethinking online teaching and learning and looking in particular at the SUNY Online Course Quality Review review rubric that will be presented by, by Alex uh, Pickett. Um, thank you, uh, uh, Alex. Now, uh, Alex is the director of the online teaching for SUNY Online at the system level of the State University of New York. She's the former director of the Open SUNY Center for Online Teaching Excellence and the former associate director of the award-winning SUNY Learning Network. Working with uh, 64 SUNY institutions, she has directly supported or coordinated the development of 300 plus online instructional designers and more than Well, Prof. Mashiri, I think we lost you for a Sorry second. Sorry about that. Thanks. Sorry about some, some network. Am I back? Um, yeah, you're good to go, Prof. Okay, sorry, sorry about the network. Uh, uh, Alex was the principal investigator. Um, Sorry, Alex was the principal uh, investigator of the SUNY SLN and GLC grant funded project. She is the co-recipient of several national awards recognizing excellence in online faculty development, distance learning innovation, online effective practices, and institution-wide programming and systematic progress. She was recognized as a Sloan Fellow in 2012, uh, an honor conferred by the Sloan Consortium Board of uh, Directors. We really look forward uh, to the presentation that Alex will give to us uh, as part of the uh, Advo Innovation in Teaching and Learning series. And ladies and gentlemen, you can see that uh, we have a person who is really uh, knowledgeable about this field and we are really looking forward to the engagement, the presentation, and the engagements that will follow. Thank you very much, Program Director, and welcome all of you colleagues. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, Prof. Thanks, Prof. Mashirev, very, very much. 
Uh, ladies and gentlemen, with the introduction and welcome from Prof. Mashile, it is now my pleasure to hand over to Alex to lead us into the discussion. Welcome, Alex, and the floor is now yours. Hi, everybody. Hi, everybody. I am going to share my screen. Uh, desktop. Yes. Okay, so hopefully everyone can see my screen. And I um, want to thank you, Professor Mashida, for that overview um, of uh, context and your very kind introduction. Um, I am so very honored to be here today. Um, and I want to especially thank Denzil and all those involved um, in planning this event. And to all of you who are participating, I want to thank you for your interest and for attending. I'm very honored to have this opportunity to address you, to introduce you to Oscar, and to open a conversation with you about online best practices and the importance of continuous online um, review, refresh, and improvements. Um, before we get started, I just want to make sure that you know that all of the um, um, links for this presentation uh, and the materials, this actual PowerPoint, um, everything that I that I share with you will be uh, posted, uh, is are posted currently at this particular URL. And um, I can't find the chat to put it in the chat, but maybe when I stop sharing, I can find it and and um, and post the links in the chat. So I don't want you to worry um, about you know trying to find links or trying to capture things. Um, you will have access to all of the links and materials for the presentation through this uh, URL, so that you can return to them when you have more time to more deeply explore them. Um, so um, let me just move forward here. Um, today, I'm going to introduce you to Oscar, uh, our online course quality rubric and the process that we use um, for uh, online course review and refresh. And my ultimate goal with this presentation is to inspire you. Uh, and for that, I need your cooperation. Uh, you're going to have to do two things. One is consider possibilities, and two is to find your why. So as you listen to this presentation, I ask you to consider the possibilities for your own online instruction and the design of your course, and just consider it. Um, that some of the things that I'm going to suggest to you today might be worth a try and might work for you in ways that you may not have anticipated. Uh, some of the standards in OSCAR are intended to help you be more efficient. Some will help you be more effective. And all are intended to support not only the success and learning of your students, but also your own success and your own satisfaction as well uh, in online teaching and learning. So the second thing that I want you to do is to find your why. Why are you here? Why do you teach? Uh, why do you teach online? What is your passion and what drives you? I think represented amongst the participants in this uh, presentation, there are a variety of roles. So if you are faculty, I'd like to inspire you and challenge you to consider possibilities for improving the design of your own course and to consider adopting a practice of continuous online improvement with the tools you will be introduced to today to regularly review and refresh the design of your online course so that you can be uh, more confident, more satisfied, more efficient, more effective online for both you and your students. If you happen to be an instructional designer, an online instructional designer, um, I love you. Um, and I want to inspire you and challenge you to teach online to keep developing your skills, to look at online course design from both faculty and student perspectives, and to contribute to the professionalization of your role so that you can better understand how to support faculty and so that you can help inform and influence the quality of online education in your department, your institution, and your country. 
if by chance you happen to be someone who supports faculty in some way, supports the technology that's used or supports online students, I want to inspire and challenge you to think outside your box and to see what you learn and what happens when you look at online education from an online instructional design perspective. And finally, if you're an administrator, I want to inspire and challenge you to better understand online teaching and learning from your online faculty and students perspectives and consider their contexts in your expectations so that you can put appropriate resources, policies and plans in place to support these efforts that are well informed by those contexts. So with that said, I want to share with you my why and why I feel urgent about this. And I want you all to know, in addition, that you, that you don't have, this feels daunting, but it, you don't have to reinvent the wheel. A lot is known today about how people uh, learn well online. So um, as part of this presentation, I also want to introduce you to your community of practice and to the global community of educators who are interested in continuously learning and improving their online teaching practices. There are representatives here today from multiple institutions, is my understanding, all here because they have some interest in this topic. Uh, this is your community. Within this community, there are there is a continuum of um, online teaching practitioners from novices to masters. Um, what an amazing resource you can be for each other to share what you know and learn from others. It's a great opportunity to use this group um, as a foundation for a cross-institutional community of online teaching practitioners to continue the conversation that we begin here today on this topic and on other topics of interest to the group beyond this event. And so I want to challenge and inspire you to do that. <laughs> this is my why. She's 19 years old and she just finished her second year of college, of university, and I'm here today because of her. I have done presentations like this every year since she was born because of her. The work that you do as faculty, instructional designers, administrators, is extremely important for her and for all of our children the work that you do every day as educators is of vital importance to our society in general, the world, and for the future. This is a tremendous effort and responsibility. It's a huge job with lots of challenges, lots of satisfaction, and very little recognition. So my why is important because I want the world to be a better place for her and for all our children, and especially for children that are not as fortunate as ours. Online learning democratizes access to education. Online education is a response to those who need access or flexibility or who adult, are adults with competing life priorities, as you all no doubt know. Um, it is not the only solution for all of the problems of poverty or for the world or for the universe, in fact, but we as educators can make a difference. And I think that's why we're all here, that we believe that. I want to thank you for your passion, for your dedication, your commitment um, that you demonstrate by being here today at this event in your Innovation in Teaching and Learning series to rethink online teaching and learning with this focus on online quality. You as individuals and your leaders and institutions that support this event inspire me that this is possible, that we can in fact change the world. All right, so. I teach Introduction to Online Teaching. This is my course. It is in Moodle. It is completely online in the Department of Education Theory and Practice at our university at Albany, one of our 64 institutions. It is a master's level course in the Curriculum Design and Instructional Technology Program, and it's a required course in the Certificate in Online Teaching and Learning. My students are pre-service educators, faculty like yourselves, instructional designers, doctoral students, and educators that are just interested in learning more about teaching online. 
The course is very interactive. It's based on projects. It's centered on the interests of learners in the course. Uh, most of the interaction in the course happens outside of Moodle. Much of the course is open and public by design. It's called ETAP 640, so if you're interested, you can Google that. Um, it's not the focus of this presentation, but I wanted you to know that I teach online uh, in addition to my, my duties as the Director of Online Learning for the State University of New York SUNY Online Program. Um, I just wanted you to, to know that. All right, so the goals for the presentation today are to, as I said, inspire you to think about online quality and introduce you to Oscar uh, and the resources that you can use to self-assess and initiate conversations about continuous online course design improvements. It's intended to give you the information and access to these tools that you can, that you can use to help you consider online quality and ongoing course review and refresh activities in your own online courses. So today you're going to get an overview of the OSCAR rubric and the process for self-assessment purposes. And we're going to discuss selected standards as a means of understanding how to apply those standards. And you're going to receive an overview of the tools and resources to support various modes of review in addition to self-assessment. Um, that could be support um, uh, other types of online course quality initiatives. Um, I'll give you a review of the OSCAR website, the OSCAR self-assessment rubric, the interactive online rubric and dashboard that are meant for larger scale online course quality um, uh, initiatives. And, um, and then we're going to consider ways that OSCAR can be implemented. Um, and there's a variety of models that, that OSCAR supports. Um, it's it's a, intentionally designed as a very flexible tool to meet the needs of those who are using it. Um, and then you're going to gain access to those tools and materials, all of which are openly licensed and free for anyone to use and adapt or adopt however they choose. All right, so for a little bit of context, oh wait, before we go on, uh, there might be a bonus. Um, I'm hoping that we'll have enough time uh, to share with you how to earn two badges at, for participating in this presentation and that you will join my online community of practice as a friend of SUNY. Um, and, um, and then if we have time, additional time, I'd like to share with you a couple of other um, resources that I think you'll find interesting. My remote online teaching checklist and my interested in teaching online self-paced course. And uh, we're planning to have ample time for questions and open discussion after the presentation. And, um, and so if you have a, a question at any time during the pres presentation, please post it in the chat. And then Denzel will help me to go back through the chat to respond to any questions that come up. So, um, so hopefully that will, um, that will work. All right, so, so some context about SUNY, just so that you have a little context about my institution. The State University of New York is the largest public state university in the United States with um, close to 400,000 students in the fall of 2020 and 35,000 plus uh, faculty. We have uh, 64 campuses, 13 are university centers and doctoral degree granting institutions, 13 are university colleges, uh, eight are colleges of technology, and we have 30 community colleges. I live very, very close to Schenectady County Community College, which is just above Albany on the right side uh, I, I don't know if I can point. Um, so uh, it's um, just above Albany. That's where I live, about three hours north of New York City uh, in the center eastern part of the state. So no matter where you are in New York, you are within a half an hour of one of our institutions. So for us, it's really not a question about distance. Um, online learning is a, is a, it's the convenience that matters. All right. So a little more um, historical context. <coughs> we started the SUNY Learning Network 
uh, or SLN in 1994 with a grant from the Sloan Foundation in their Anytime Anywhere program. This was testing um, uh, concepts. Uh, from 94 to 98, we received a series of grants totaling $4.1 million from Sloan, and that took us through a variety of phases from proof of concept to scalability, sustainability, institutionalization, and resulted um, in, uh, in the SUNY Learning Network being created. And we now have 20 plus years of um, experience and excellence and innovation in online teaching and learning just by virtue of the fact that we started in 1994. So, you know, it's not, I think that any of us are any smarter or, you know, know more than anyone else. We just started a long time ago. Uh, so we've learned a lot in the process. Um, today, SUNY offers um, almost 686 online degrees or certificates from um, across 50 of our campuses. We have 26,000 annual um, online course sections. That was the 2019-2020 um, academic year. We have 220,000 plus total student um, uh, online student enrollments, and that was also academic year 1920. And we have close to, we have over 85,000 uh, um, of those enrollments, of those 220,000 enrollments, um, 85,000 plus take 50% or more of their instruction online, and that was also 2019, 2020. Um, so we, in addition, have um, 127 programs from 22 campuses that are part of the SUNY Online Plus program. Um, these specific, uh, specifically target, targeted online programs have to meet some signature elements. Uh, and then there's 27 programs from nine campuses, um, and this is effective fall 2021, um, that are involved in our Degrees at Scale initiative, which is intended to scale certain programs to enrollments of a thousand or more students. So our context is quite different from, um, from the South African context, uh, obviously, and of course, um, you know, the majority of our courses are small enrollment, what one would consider, what, what I think you would consider small enrollments of, of typical what they're calling now traditional online, um, which is a cohort of students with a professor um, in a particular semester um, that has a start date and an end date and goes through about 15 weeks of instruction um, asynchronously and um, with somewhere around 30, 20, 30, 35 um, students. Those are our typical courses. Um, so this program, this Degrees at Scale program is intended to start to attempt to uh, create uh, larger enrollment courses. Um, all right, so um, the SUNY Online Teaching Unit that I lead consists of these four pillars. And just for context, I want you to know that the OSCAR project came out of the Course Supports Project or the pillar, the course supports pillar. We have a, um, a focus on research that has informed pretty much everything, every aspect of our award-winning online faculty development and course design processes. As mentioned in my intro, um, the last time they were able to count when we were centralized, I've trained over um, 5,000 online faculty and over 300 online instructional designers. Our model features a campus-based online instructional designer that works individually with campuses and faculty um, and a centrally provided organization, my unit, that provides and coordinates a, uh, a menu of resources and services and opt-in professional development supports for online practitioners, including um, faculty, online faculty, and online instructional designers. Again, uh, um, in addition, for context, I was the first online instructional designer in SUNY, and so, you know, that role and that profession is very near and, and dear to my heart. Um, a focus on online pedagogy, online quality, and online faculty development community and continuous online course design and online teaching improvements have been key to our successes. My programs, models, materials, and approaches have been adopted by many 
and adapted by many over the years. My online instructional certificate program, for example, and our online course quality rubric Oscar were adopted by the Online Learning Consortium, formerly the Sloan Consortium. Um, and um, it has been used, uh, these tools have been used to train hundreds of instructional designers and improve thousands of, of online courses across the country and internationally. Uh, OLC is an international professional association for online teaching and learning professionals, and we are charter members of this association, and I, I highly recommend it. My um, learner-centered online pedagogical model uh, was uh, introduced to, uh, to UNISA by Bill Pels. I don't know if anyone in the audience it, it, what, met him or participated in the project, but he actually uh, traveled to UNISA to assist with your signature programs project. Um, and th this was a few years ago now. Um, most recently, Oscar has been translated into Spanish and is being used by an organization in Chile to train online faculty and instructional designers in South America. And we have a proposal to translate Oscar into French that's currently being developed in conjunction with the Virtual University of West Africa. Uh, GMIT, a university system in Ireland, has also adopted and adapted OSCAR for their online programs and has adapted many of our online engagement activities to build their community of online instructional designers and faculty. So here's a, an overview of the, the timeline of when things started and, and certain milestones and events that happened um, in, the, in the history of OSCAR. Um, we started the development in 2014 of OSCAR. OLC adopted OSCAR in 2016. We won a number of awards uh, from national organizations um, over the years. And we are currently now in version 3.1 of uh, OSCAR and continue to make changes and improvement to the tools, resources, and standards. For example, we have some mobile standards ready to go and we're currently working on improving the standards and documentation to highlight and reinforce the notion of regular and substantive interaction, which is now a focus of, um, and a US legal requirement um, by our department, our, our federal department of education to differentiate between correspondence courses and online courses uh, that are eligible for financial aid. So this is a very important initiative that we're working on currently. All right, now let me, what I'd like to do is, uh, is, is begin the, the, uh, the overview and um, the introduction to Oscar by sharing a video with you about Oscar. So I'm just going to play the video. Open SUNY has developed an online course design rubric and process that addresses both the instructional design and accessibility of an online course that is openly licensed for anyone to use and adapt. The aim of the Open SUNY Course Quality Review, OSCAR, rubric and process is to support continuous improvements to the quality and accessibility of online courses, while also providing a systematic approach to collect data across campuses, institutions, departments, and programs that can be used to inform faculty development and support large-scale online course design, review, and refresh efforts consistently. There are two components, the OSCAR process and the OSCAR rubric. The OSCAR process provides a framework and a dashboard to support a campus-tailored and scalable approach to improving the instructional design and accessibility of online or blended courses. There are three parts to the process. The online course review using the OSCAR rubric yields an action plan that informs the online course refresh process by targeting areas for improvements. After the identified areas have been refreshed and implemented, the learning review closes the continuous improvement loop to confirm the success of the changes made and the development of a plan for the next set of improvements. The dashboard is housed in Google Drive, which allows for free storage and collaboration. It automates campus level course review efforts and accommodates custom Customized rubrics by managing all the rubrics for the institution. Built-in analytics track course review progress and can be used to identify online course design trends. 
Working with multi-institutional teams of SUNY online instructional designers, librarians, distance learning directors, and technologists, Open SUNY staff started with the Chico rubric. 20 years of SUNY Learning Network research informed best online practices. The SUNY Office of General Counsel's Memorandum on Accessibility Considerations, Universal Learning Design Principles, and conducted a gap analysis with Quality Matters, iNicole, and Blackboard exemplary courses. The resulting 50 standards in the rubric target online instructional design and incorporate the community of inquiry model, the seven principles for good practice in undergraduate education, the adult learner, Bloom's taxonomy, how people learn, and has been mapped to the open SUNY fundamental and core competencies for online course design. The rubric is easy to use, flexible, non-evaluative, requires no storage space, can be customized, and can be implemented in a variety of ways. As part of an online faculty development and online course design professional development process, as an online faculty self-assessment, as part of an online course quality review process by online instructional designers, as a faculty peer review process, in a multidisciplinary collaborative team review model. The rubric also produces an action plan, allows for prioritization of standards, estimates amount of time to make improvements, offers suggestions and examples for improvements, accommodates modification and addition of standards. The 50 Oscar rubric standards also integrate specific ways to make an online course accessible to students with disabilities. Oscar was adopted by the Online Learning Consortium in 2016 and is featured as the online course quality rubric in their suite of online quality scorecards. The Open SUNY Oscar rubric is flexible, customizable, research-based, openly licensed for anyone to use and adapt, and nationally recognized. It is currently being used by 56 SUNY institutions and hundreds of non-SUNY institutions and individuals. For more information on Open SUNY and OSCAR, visit OSCAR.org. That's O-S-C-Q-R dot org. So actually the URL is OSCAR.SUNY.edu. We changed domains, so I'll share the uh, the proper link um, for the Oscar website um, at the end of the presentation. Um, so the goal with Oscar is to ensure that all online courses meet quality instructional design and accessibility standards, and that they are regularly and systematically reviewed, refreshed, and improved to reflect campus guidelines and research-based online effective practices. Um, the OSCAR framework uh, provides a process and resources to systematically review, refresh, and continuously improve on the instructional design and accessibility of online courses. The in, um, instrument that supports, um, it is an instrument that supports continuous improvement in the design of online courses. It's intended as a professional tool to provide a framework for iteration in online course design and promote and scaffold continuous improvements and course quality. It is not intended as a course or a faculty evaluation tool. Uh, it's a framework and a process and a resource for course review, course refresh, and continuous online improvement. Um, and I want to you know, mention and, and, and kind of reiterate that it is um, unique from other um, rubrics in those, in those aspects. It is not intentional. It is intentionally designed to not be um, a way to score or fail faculty or evaluate faculty. Um, it also is intentionally narrow in its scope. It focuses only on instructional design and, um, and on accessibility. There are many other things that go into um, online quality, um, and uh, this tool is intended to focus in on the instructional design of the course. So, um, so we're gonna get a tour of the site. You're gonna get access to OSCAR, um, and I, I'm gonna give you a demo of the interactive rubric and dashboard. Um, so that you can see some of the different models that are supported by the interactive online tools and so that you can 
see, get a taste for the use of the dashboard, perhaps for some larger scale initiatives. And in the use of these tools, Chrome is best if you're going to actually use and implement them. I happen to be in Firefox at the moment, but um, to actually use the tools, um, Chrome is, a, is the better tool to, the better browser to use for this. All right, so let's go to Oscar. Um, so the, the URL is here, oscar.suny.edu. Um, and um, this is the companion website to the rubric that provides all of the tools and information of, um, for, for Oscar in general and for each of the standards specifically. And so there's some information about Oscar, including that video that we, uh, that we just looked at. Um, and some information about how um, about the Oscar process and about how Oscar is unique. So if you are um, trying to explain what Oscar is to to others, um, you are welcome to use uh, the information that's here to help you to um, find that video, which I think does a good job of giving an overview and um, some other information um, about Oscar. Um, so um, there are 50 standards uh, in OSCAR, um, and each standard, um, there are six categories of standards, and each um, um, standard has a, a consistent look and feel. So each standard provides a full explanation of the standard. Um, it lists examples and, and suggestions and ideas. It provides links to related research. And, um, and then we crosswalk each standard with um, the, the topper project and um, the OLC effective practices. Topper is a um, Gates funded project out of the University of Central Florida that is collecting in a repository, a searchable repository of um, peer reviewed um, online effective practices. And so we crosswalked Oscar with both Topper and with the OLC effective practices and posted links uh, to any that we found um, within each standard, you know, evidence that supports each standard. Um, and then each, you know, Oscar is an openly uh, licensed tool and it is, you know, really is what it is based on those who use it and those who help us to continuously improve it. And so we have provided a mechanism on each of the standards for anyone to submit examples or evidence or best practices that they would like to be considered for inclusion on the site. And so I invite all of you to take a look at certain standards. And if you have anything that you would like to see um, represented on each standard, I, I invite you to, um, to submit it. Um, so, um, so let's take a look at sort of the anatomy of a standard. I pulled out standard 10 um, because it's one of the more self-explanatory and, and easier ones to take a look at. Um, for this brief overview. Uh, this one, standard 10, is in the category of um, course overview and information. As you can see, these are the standards in that category. Um, so this, uh, this standard says that the course provides contact information for the instructor um, and um, uh, not just the instructor, but the department and the program as well. And so, um, you can see there's a, a full description and, and explanation of the standard. Uh, it then provides some ideas for how to refresh your course with, um, with this particular standard in mind. Um, and, um, you know, things like making sure to share your expectations, um, uh, information about your required or optional office hours, um, any specific areas in the course that are intended for asking questions um, and some suggestions for practice uh, so that if you get contacted in a way that's not your preference, you, you direct them to the way that you would prefer to be contacted, those kinds of 
of suggestions. Um, we also have this section on exploring related resources. And then, of course, this is the section here at the bottom of every standard. There's the way where you can comment on a standard or you can contribute a, a suggestion for inclusion in um, on this web page. So we review the comments periodically and then, um, um, you know, make modifications or additions, edits to the page based on that. Each um, of the standards has this little micro learning video. I'll play this one a little bit. It's important for students, especially in an online environment, to be able to know all the different ways they can contact their professor. Um, again, because it's not a face-to-face -face environment, and so they um, will often feel very stressed out if they don't know how to reach a professor. I post a syllabus first, and on, at the very top of the syllabus, I have all of my contact information, my email address, my phone number, the secretary of the division's phone number, um, and my office hours. And then I also have a course information folder Folder within the um, within the module when they first open it that has the exact same information. So they have two different places to access it. So every standard has this little micro learning video. These videos are members of our own community that we have recorded and um, talking about each of the standards. So we've leveraged our own community of online practitioners to um, help give some additional perspective and information about each of the standards. Um, so as you can see, um, there's a link here to get Oscar. We'll go there in a second. We also have um, information on implementation, um, which, um, uh, which you can explore on, on using the various tools and and on, um, on using, uh, on creating some initiatives around um, implementing OSCAR. Of course, we have a number of people who have been involved over the years in the development and, and, and improvements, the continuous improvements of OSCAR. So we have that on our acknowledgements page. On the research page, we continuously collect and update um, information that is OSCAR related. Um, so that you can um, see some of the work and research that's being done um, uh, around the use of OSCAR and um, uh, around stand, um, research that is supporting specific standards. We have a page that lists our awards. Um, the community link, um, because this is an open licensed product, people can make modifications and do things to their own versions. And so here we highlight some of the things that some of the community members who use Oscar have shared with us. Um, so, um, you know, to, to continue to, in the spirit of, uh, of openly licensed tools, to continue to share things that the community creates. We have some information on instruction, on course design, um, to share and some um, information on, on training. Now let's go back to get Oscar. This was an, another goal for, for this presentation was to share with you how to actually get access um, to the Oscar tools. Um, so um, the, the first model is the self-assessment rubric. And the self-assessment rubric is the one that you would get if you go to the OLC um, um, website. This is the Online Learning Consortium's website. And if you look for the OSCAR um, scorecard, you will find the link to where you can download the scorecard. It is a PDF, it is free. Uh, and you can see there that you know they they recognize our our partnership on this. And um, all you have to do is fill out a form that you know gives them your name, um, a little bit of demographic information, so that they can keep track of who's using Oscar. And then it automatically will um, download as a PDF for you. Let me show you the PDF. Um, here we go. Uh, so this is the PDF that you would get 
um, when you download, this is the exact rubric that you would get when you download uh, the, um, the rubric from OLC. All right, so um, the other ways to get, um, uh, to get access to other uh, tools uh, that are OSCAR related, I mentioned and the video mentioned that there's an online interactive rubric and there's an online interactive dashboard. Uh, and so I'm going to demonstrate those in a second, but the way to get them is to simply, you know, go to this link, click on this link and you get a form. And all you do is enter your email address and the name of your course and then click submit and go through the, and it'll go through the process of actually mailing you um, um, a copy of uh, the interactive online um, rubric. This is as, as I mentioned, um, a tool that is based in Google Docs. It is an application that is based in Google Docs. And so um, this will generate a rubric for you and, um, and mail, email it to you with instructions. Um, the same is true with the dashboard. And as I mentioned, the dashboard is um, intended for some larger scale projects. And I'll demonstrate that in a second, but this is how you access it. You simply give us your um, email address and um, your institutional name. And if you're from an institution that's outside of SUNY, you just put your, your institution's name there. And, um, and then it will do the same thing. It is also a Google Sheet uh, application and it will generate one for you and email you the instructions on how to open it up in your own Google Drive. So it lives in your Google Drive. It belongs to you. You can do whatever you choose with it. We don't have access to it. Once you generate your own copy of it, it is it is yours. Um, we can't see it. We don't. The only thing we collect is your email address and your institution, just so that we know who has who who has downloaded it, who's using it. Um, uh, okay, so let me show let me show you the interactive rubric here. Give you a, a little tour of how this works. When you fill out that form, you will get this Google Sheet. Um, and it will, it asks you for your course name, so the title, so this will be pre-populated um, with whatever you gave, uh, whatever course title you gave it. And then it wants you to fill out some, um, some details about the course just to, um, to capture some information uh, for the course. And then you will see down along the bottom, there is a tab for the instructional designer and a tab for a generic reviewer and a tab for the faculty person or subject matter expert. And um, this interactive online tool is different from the PDF that I showed you in that it is designed um, to support some varied uh, approaches to course review and refresh. And so, in some of our campuses, and the reason that we designed the tool this way is because we have 64 campuses, all of whom are unique and independent in many ways, and who have varying types of staff and varying types of needs and contexts and and um, approaches to all everything. Uh, they, New York is the empire state, and every institution is an empire, is its own empire with its own leadership and its own policies and its own faculty. And and uh, though we're a system, um, each uh, institution is is uh, is independent in many ways. So we needed a tool that could accommodate a variety of approaches. And so on some of our campuses, instructional designers lead the um, the the. Um, course review and refresh initiatives. On some of our campuses, we have a team approach. So it might be a team of peer faculty within a department, or it might be a team of people who have uh, sort of different areas of expertise. So maybe um, a technologist or a multimedia person, a librarian, um, a student, um, a subject matter expert who doesn't teach the course. So, so we needed a mechanism to allow for this kind of, you know, customization of the approach to course review. Uh, so the PDF is intended for a self-assessment so that faculty can essentially independently 
reflect, um, use the rubric to reflect on the design of their own online course to self-assess themselves on each of the standards, and then to use the, the, um, the materials and the resources to, um, to target the things that they would like to improve in the next iteration of their course. Um, they can do that independently or they can take that action plan to an instructional designer and work with an instructional designer to make those selected improvements. This notion of continuous online improvement means that you're not ever done. <laughs> Um, that you, that every time you teach the course, you should review and revise, um, you know, the, the, the design of the course, review the materials, review your approaches, improve your practices, um, so that you can continuously improve um, in, um, in each delivery of the course. So, um, so they can take it with to an instructional designer to have some to have their input and help on it, or they can do it independently. This interactive um, online tool, as I said, is intended for either use by um, instructional designers or a team of people. And actually, if an instructor wants to make use of some of the interactive components of this tool, an individual instructor could do it as a self-assessment as well. So there's nothing to prevent anyone from going to the Get Oscar page and downloading a copy of this rubric, this interactive rubric, and implementing it however they would like to. The tool itself has a number of very cool features. And so, um, you know, some of the things that I think are unique about Oscar is that it doesn't score you. You're not giving yourself points or scoring yourself. You're asking uh, about whether or not the standard is sufficiently present whether or not it might require a minor revision and a minor revision is a half an hour or less or whether it might be a more moderate revision which might be a half hour to two hours to improve um, the design of or a major revision which might take someone more than two hours now this is subjective it is up to whoever's filling it out to determine and of course someone who has you know, significant experience and significant technical skills might be able to do some things more quickly than others. It's, it's totally subjective, but it's intended to capture that information, to give information so that whoever is going to end up doing the improvements has, kind, and, and whoever, or whoever is going to be identified as making those improvements so that you have a full picture of how long people think it will take. Um, so, um, so you simply, you know, um, put an X in uh, in every um, block where you think, um, you know, something um, needs improvement. And here, you would um, uh, type in some of your feedback, some of your additional information, and then, of course, if you need additional ideas, um, each standard links to one of the Oscar standard to the specific Oscar standard page. So right here I'm on standard number two and or orientation or overview is provided for the course overall. And so if you need ideas for how to improve that standard as you're looking at the standard and how it's been implemented in the course, you can go over to the web page um, itself and, um, and look at um, um, what the standard actually is about, you know, more detail about what the standard is about um, in, in terms of an explanation. You can look at ideas for refreshing um, and you can see some other practices that are have been identified and some other resources about it. So if you're doing it independently, you have resources to refer to. Um, and if you're doing it collaboratively, your perspective might be um, different from someone else's. So the intention is for either an individual instructor or instructional designer to fill this out or a team of people to fill this out. Once they have completed, and you can see, I'll, I'll go to each tab. This is the reviewer tab. Oops, sorry. Um, and this is the faculty tab. Once you've completed the review, um, you can go over to the action plan. And the action plan actually, um, you know, you then can print this out and it actually gives you an aggregate. This is the test that I just um, added there. 
Um, it automatically aggregates the feedback from every tab into this action plan and gives you the time to fix and whether or not it's important or essential according to our designations. Now, it's an openly licensed tool, so if you have different ideas about what is important and what is essential, you can customize that to your department, to your institution, to your initiative. Um, these things are customizable. You just need to have somebody who knows how to um, program the, um, the Google Sheet uh, to make those changes and adjustments. Um, all right, let's see, what else do I have for you on this page? I think that's it for, um, for this page. Let me show you the dashboard. Um, the dashboard, as I said, is intended for larger scale initiatives. So if you're just an individual instructional designer with a very few number of courses, um, you don't really need the dashboard, or if you're an individual instructor who wants to do this, uh, this tool is intended to manage larger scale projects. And so from this dashboard, you can generate rubrics for all of the courses that you would like to be reviewed, and you can assign them to an instructional designer and a faculty person or another reviewer and, um, and, and then you can link to the specific rubrics that have been created for each of the individual independent course reviews that are taking place um, so that as the manager of this project, you can link directly to them um, and, and have it all in one place. And so um, I have in this demo here a list of courses, um, the, the associated rubrics. Um, and here for the ID, it actually will tell you what percentage of the rubric is, is complete in terms of, you know, being finished, um, you know, being filled out. So we can see that this intro to computers has not yet begun, but the geography of Middle Earth is, a, is 100 percent complete. And um, the estimated time to refresh the course is um, almost 26 hours. And the... Um, instructional designer assigned is Aaron and um, and here are the notes for this particular course. So this allows a manager of, of a larger scale initiative, a dashboard that they can use to create rubrics, assign rubrics and track rubrics. Um, the, the tool has some additional um, um, features. There are some analytics, very rudimentary analytics that can help you to understand how people are doing in standards across all of the courses that are being reviewed. It will also allow you to um, apply different rubrics for different purposes. So perhaps your nursing program has a different rubric than your STEM program. Um, so you can customize rubrics for specific purposes and then um, use this tool to apply those rubrics to some larger scale activities and initiatives. Um, and I think that's that's good and, and, and enough on this. There's lots to talk about and lots to understand about how the tools are used, but we have lots of resources and lots of information. And if anyone is interested in adopting the dashboard, I can connect you with someone who can help you um, um, set up a dashboard of your own, and it's usually best to do that with some help, um, and, um, and, 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 and then go from there. So let's look at the first section of, um, of uh, standards. This is in the course overview and information area. And in this section, we're gonna, um, uh, we're gonna look at all of the categories, um, and then we're gonna select certain, I've selected certain um, standards to take a closer look at so that we can um, discuss them uh, with the group. Um, I just made a stab at picking some that I thought were uh, of interest, uh, that might be of interest or that, you know, that we could talk about. I mean, they're all interesting to me, but I had to choose. So for this particular category, I chose um, standard number three. The course includes a course information area that deconstructs the syllabus for learners in a clear and navigable way. Um, so this standard um, 
uh, again, is set up exactly the way all of the standards are um, with the consistent information and the, the, the video and, and some even more um, um, in-depth video on this particular standard. Um, so for this, um, for this standard, um, um, the course information area is uh, really important, and I think it can be it can be achieved in a variety of ways. Every course, of course, has a syllabus, and and where that syllabus is placed and how it is presented is very very important. Um, I'll talk about that in a minute. But the the basic elements of of a um, of a of a course information area. Um, is uh, are these elements and and I'm sure you know all syllabi have these but in an online course as you know one needs to be very very explicit about expectations and about specifics about the course and so it's very important that you try to anticipate any student questions um, in the this documentation so that any questions that the student might have they they are able to immediately understand and see where they might find the answer to that question and so by labeling things and and this standard is suggesting a deconstructed syllabus but it doesn't actually it doesn't have to be uh, deconstructed in this particular manner where every section has its own it has its own um, document for example but that is one way to very clearly help students see where to go and and what to do um, and so this is one example of how to do it. Um, you can also have a downloadable syllabus um, you, um, and, and if you clearly lay out the sections of the syllabus and label the sections very well, then that can achieve the same goal. This particular document has examples of, of um, this is an example of a, of a deconstructed syllabus. Each is a separate document, so if you go to the welcome document. This is an example of a course welcome. Um, so each of these um, um, links here shows you um, some examples of, of what this might look like. And, and next to it are the, um, the OSCAR standards that each of these, um, that applies to each of these sections. Um, so, uh, so, you know, you can come back to this, you'll get the link to this. And if you want to dive a little bit deeper and look at the different types of, of, um, examples that are posted here, you, you can, um, I mentioned how important it is for students to be able to easily find, um, the information that they're looking for, especially at the start of a course. And this particular study. Um, is is really important um, in, in in support of this standard. The issue of findability is studied in this particular research, um, and has shown to be uh, or has has um, you know resulted in in um, some findings that were very startling to me when I first uh, came across this study. They actually conducted an eye tracking study. And the results were that, you know, especially at the start of a course, initially, if a student um, couldn't find something like contact information or how they were going to be evaluated or what the preferred modes of communication were, the students feel um, frustrated, discouraged, and irritated. And they not only consider the course to be broken if they can't find something, but they, um, uh, they blame and they judge the professor as not competent to teach the course. And I was stunned by this finding um, that simply burying information in a syllabus that is not easy to find um, has that impact on the satisfaction and on the, the, the judgments that the, that the students have about the course and the instructor. So I think it is incredibly important. The standard is very important. Um, all right, let's move on to standard number nine. Uh, standard nine is about course objectives. Um, the course objectives and outcomes are clearly defined, measurable, and aligned to learning activities and assessments. And of course, you know, the ideas for, um, for improving the standard are to make sure that all of your 
um, content interaction and activities all map to your course and program um, objectives. Um, it, it, there are some suggestions about using specific verbs that are actionable and measurable in terms of writing objectives and outcomes. Um, it's um, suggesting that any activities that do not directly map to one of the objectives, that those be eliminated. Um, those might be, you know, interesting or um, nice um, that you want to share with your students, but that's sort of the impulse for faculty in an online course is to put everything they know in a course. So um, that ends up becoming then a course and a half for the students from the point of, uh, of, of workload and, and muddies um, the actual um, outcomes or, or, or learning objectives that the instructor has to the course. So the easy way to understand how to do this is um, following universal learning design principles or backwards design where you understand what are the learning objectives, what are the activities that support those objectives, and what are the assessments and, and modes of feedback that are going to be designed in order to, um, to assess their um, ability to know or understand whatever it is that, that you've had them do in the course. So, so eliminating any of the, the extraneous stuff will help keep the, the course very focused and doable, both from the student and faculty perspective. Again, verbs um, in your objectives that are measurable, talking directly to students when you're communicating um, objectives as opposed to separating um, your, the, the learner from the objective. So you will learn as opposed to learners will learn. Um, that simple you know, um, uh, change in in perspective is is important to connect with the students in this online medium. Um, understanding Bloom's taxonomy and, and the various levels of, of um, uh, higher order um, thinking skills um, and um, help, helping to make sure that the students understand um, you know, what's going on in the course, what the objectives are of the course, what the activities are, how they're going to be assessed, and how there is alignment between all of those activities is important to reiterate with students. So I have for some resources to share with you this workload estimator that can help you understand and identify the amount of time it takes to do things. Um, there's a there's a couple of different ones. This is the one that I have seen that it, that is um, um, you know that I like the best, I guess. So you you say what is the duration of the course, and as you adjust this, um, uh, you know I don't know if you can see down here at the bottom. As I adjust things, the um, the workload estimates will change. So for example, you, you go in and you put in how many pages per week they'll have to write, what the page density is, will extensive drafting, no drafting or minimal drafting be required? Are they engaging in um, many new concepts or, or no new concepts? Um, what's the purpose of the activity? How many discussion posts? How long or average length? Um, how many other assignments? And as I move this slider, for example, you'll see that the total number of hours per week and contact hours vary. Anytime I make any change to any of these things, um, this total workload estimate will, will change so that you can better understand and gauge how much time the students will be working independently, how many contact hours, and how many total um, um, hours over time um, uh, will exist. So I hope this tool could be useful to you. Um, this is a tool that perhaps this is a, a page, uh, uh, some information um, that I hope I, that I have used for many years. Um, it was last updated in 2010, but it is uh, still works uh, and is very simple and succinct. It really shows you what is a, um, a you know not a well designed objective and what is a better objective, and it really has to do with how the um, how the objective is phrased. Um, so knowing is, um, is the operative word here in the poor objective and writing an essay uh, dot 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 to identify and explain is a, w a better way to, to address this objective, to, to state this objective. So I like this page because it gives those examples. Um, 
Bloom's Taxonomy I mentioned, and I, I really love this tool. If you're not familiar with Bloom's uh, Taxonomy, this really helps you to understand the levels. Remember is at the lowest level. Are you, and, and in lower level courses, you have to memorize things. So it's not better than anything or worse than anything. It simply is one of the levels. Um, and as you move up the, 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 um, the pyramid here, um, understanding is the next layer, applying is the next layer, analyzing and evaluating and creating are the other layers. And this gives you a framework to understand the various dimensions, right? So there's a factual dimension, there's a conceptual dimension, a procedural dimension and a metacognitive dimension. So as you're designing activities, if you're in the remember um, um, dimension here, you can design activities with the understanding that this is what you want them to be able to do. You want them to be able to list secondary, primary and secondary colors, recognize things, recall things and identify things. And then the same is true here um, at the create level. Um, so generate, assemble, design and create. So this can help you to design activities um, that will target these um, incrementally increasing dimensions so that you can know better what is um, appropriate at what level um, for, uh, for your, um, your instruction and your course. So here's a list of verbs. We talked a lot about um, verbs. And I like this because it's colorful um, and, and kind of cute. I like owls. Um, and, and it's based on the blooms, you know, creating, evaluating, analyzing, applying, understanding, and remembering. And these are all the verbs that are associated with that. I also have a link for you um, that just lists a whole bunch of verbs to help you, um, you know, think about what, you know, how to phrase your objectives. Um, all right. And then... Um, Oh, here's this is the link for the PDF that I just showed you um, with all of the, 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 the verbs in text. All right, so let's go to the next category, which is technology and tools. And um, in this particular standard um, that I've these two, these three standards that I've selected, um, uh, the first is technical skills required for participation in course learning activities scaffold. Um, in, uh, in a timely manner, orientation, practice application where appropriate. So this is about scaffolding um, um, technical skills within your course. And, um, and I think, um, you know, this is done through a process of orientation, practice and application. So you want to think if in your course, if you have um, tools that the students are, are meant to use both within the LMS and external to the LMS, you want to give them some low stakes activities and orientation and documentation about these tools so that they can practice and apply it in a low stakes kind of a way um, uh, so that they can build their skills and, and troubleshoot any, any problems that might arise um, before they're in, uh, you know, uh, um, uh, an activity that is going to be evaluated. Um, so you might consider having some sort of a technology orientation module. You might consider providing some video orientation to uh, some of the tools uh, that you use, and you might um, consider including some tips and tricks uh, related to any of the technology uh, tools that you might use. Um, all right, let's go to the next link. The, uh, the other two were um, the course includes privacy um, policies for technology tools. And so this is basically, you know, um, getting information from your um, um, either administration or from your technology people on, on privacy issues and making sure that you have, po you have links to those uh, within your course. Um, and um, so, so this is a pretty simple one. In terms of standards, some of them are more complex and require more time and more um, energy and effort on the part of, of the instructor. And some of them are simply, you know, is, is it there or not? And, um, you know, can you find somebody to give you the link to this one, for example? So this is a fairly straightforward one and, and pretty self-explanatory. 
Um, standard 15 is about accessibility standards so that any tools that you use, you want to make sure that they meet accessibility standards and anything that you incorporate into your into your course. And, and there are a bunch of standards that are accessibility related. We'll look at those in a second. Um, but if you're using technology, you might want to um, make sure that you confirm that the technology it, uh, meets accessibility standards. Um, and um, and you can you know check the, um, the the site that provides the tool to see what their accessibility standards are that they that they meet or comply with, and also check with your tech support people, your 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 um, technologists, to make sure that it's a tool that's supported uh, and that it is. Um, that it is in fact, um, um, you know, accessible. Um, one tool, for example, that I've used in the past um, is called Prezi. It's sort of like a PowerPoint, but it, it zooms in and out. I don't know if you're familiar with that tool, but that tool is not, um, is not accessible. So that's not a tool that you, um, that you want to um, standardize on, or if you do use it, you want to have make sure you have alternatives for anyone who um, uh, who might not be able to um, use it for various reasons. All right, let's move on to design and layout. The first standard here is a logical, consistent, and uncluttered layout is established, and the course is easy to navigate um, with a consistent color scheme, icon layout related content organized, uh, the, uh, the organized, uh, the content's organized together, related content is organized together and um, titles are self-evident. Um, so in, in this one, um, um, let's see, is this it? Yeah, the, um, the anatomy of a module um, is, uh, is important here and so Thinking about, and you may have course templates that you use that may already deal with this, and and I'm sure m many of you who have been doing this for a while, um, this is stuff that you know. Um, uh, but in terms of standards, this is you know a standard that you would take a look at and make sure that it's present and and um, articulated in, uh, in the design of the course. So. Um, so you use modules to present content and to chunk the content into various, um, um, you know, sections that are logical and make sense to you. It's not prescriptive in how you do that. It's entirely up to, you know, the discipline, the instructor, the institution. Um, but it's simply saying you want to chunk your modules, your course into modules that make sense where there's some, um, some logic. And so it could be content, it could be chapters of a textbook, it could be um, by date and time frame, it could be metaphor, it could be steps in a process, or it could be combinations of those things. The one magic, the one key to remember is the magic number is seven plus or minus two. If you go um, under five modules, we have studied this and know that learner and faculty satisfaction and reported learning go down. If you go over nine modules in a course, we've um, learned that um, uh, learner satisfaction and reported learning also go down. So the magic number is seven plus or minus two. Um, so you want an overview for each module, and here's a rough, you know, anatomy of a of a of a module. You know, you provide an overview, you present some content, you design some interactions. Um, and those interactions can be independent interactions or with the instructor or between the students. Um, you want to plan for opportunities for self-assessment, evaluation, and reflection. Um, and you want to set expectations um, and plan how you're going to provide feedback. Is it you know, a grade? Um, is there narrative? Is it a video feedback? Is it an audio feedback? Is it a project that um, that gets peer reviewed by students, those kinds of things. So you want to have all of that set up in a consistent um, modular structure. Um, all right. Um, so this is another, so that one, that previous one that we just did, 16, it is a bit of, you know, requires a bit of work. Um, 22 is simply, is this so or not, right? A sans serif font, this is an accessibility standard. 
a sans serif font of um, at least 12 points is used. And this is really entirely about re readability and accessibility. You want to make sure that you're not varying the size uh, too much. If you use sans serif, it's more readable than if you use serif. And so uh, this is simply um, you know, a way to check and make sure that things are systematic and consistent in terms of, uh, of readability in the course. Um, and then this one um, is about tables. And this is another accessibility standard that is recommending that if you present content in, in a tabular format, and so it can either be data that you're presenting or using tables to design the look of the page. Those are the two ways that tables are used. Um, this um, standard is saying that um, if you can, it's preferable to display your, the, the stuff that's in the, ta the, the table in a linear way outside of a table for um, accessibility reasons. Web readers have a very hard time with tables unless they are designed specifically to be web accessible. And it's possible to do that. Um, I would suggest, you know, I have a number of resources that I will share with you that will help you understand how to create tables if you need to use a table to make sure that they would be readable well by a, by a, um, um, uh, you know, a screen reader. Um, but um, this is an example of a table, straight up table, and you can see the categories across the top and then the, the terms and then the numbers uh, of, um, and the totals and all of that. So um, what I have here is how it will sound to a web reader if it's not done right. Table with eight columns and five rows, fall term, freshman, sophomore, junior, senior, post, back, non dash degree, total 2,742, 40, 30, 18, 34, 18, 40, 36, 39, 300, 44, 306, 31, 62, 82, 88, 88, 88, 88, 88, 88, 88, 88, 88, 88, 88, so the person who can't see the table and understand that it not only goes across, but it goes down, will not be able to make any sense out of it. So in order to make this table web accessible, you need to add a little bit of code so that it will read the header with the data that is in each cell. So you may need some assistance um, if you're going to put things into tables. Um, for any reason to make sure that your tables are, are web accessible. Um, all right, so um, let's go on to uh, content and activities. Uh, and the first one I've highlighted is the course offers a, access to a variety of engaging resources that facilitate communication, collaboration, deliver content and support learner engagement. For this particular um, standard, um, you want to explore a variety of types of learning activities. Um, and, you know, there's a lot of subjectivity here, a lot of opportunity for um, creativity, I think, um, in thinking about how you design your activities. Um, the focus of this is to provide a variety of engaging resources that facilitate the communication and collaboration to deliver the content and support that learning engagement. So I have some resources that I wanted to share with you that gives you um, a whole bunch of types of activities and ways that you might design them for an online environment. And so for example, if you want oral reports, um, your students to do oral reports. This tool gives you kind of an overview of how you might do that, a description, um, you know, um, and then some prerequisites, um, how, what materials might be used, some guiding questions, um, and then how you actually might do it, some possible activities um, that you might actually do. And what I love about this tool um, is that it, it totally considers the online delivery um, method. And so these are asynchronous methods and these are synchronous methods for how to approach this type of activity. 
and then how to um, assess. And it even provides you with some rubrics that you can customize for uh, the particular um, activity. So it's very, very, um, it's very, very thorough in describing how you approach each of these different types of activities that you might be familiar with doing in, in a face-to-face -face classroom, or you might not have considered how they might be achieved in an online um, environment. And so I really, I really like this tool. I also have um, a, a document that I uh, created um, uh, that I call um, 50 Alternatives to Lecture. Um, that really goes through a bunch of different ideas uh, for how to do some of these things, like have a guest speaker or how to, you know, conduct an interview, those kinds of things. Oops. Um, uh, so I'm, these links you will have so that you can um, look at them more in depth um, when, when you have a little bit more time. Um, this standard um, is about providing learners with the opportunity to develop higher order learning and problem uh, higher order thinking and problem solving skills, um, such as critical reflection and analysis. These are higher up on Bloom's um, taxonomy. And so you want to make sure that your objectives are focused on, um, you know, targeting those higher order thinking skills. And so the Bloom's taxonomy can give you a framework to think about what you might design to achieve that. And so the higher ones are um, create, evaluate, and analyze. And so you want to think also about these very dimensions. Um, so it's not just, you know, you're not just in the analyze uh, dimension. You also have these other various um, ways that you can approach this um, um, analysis dim dimension. Um, one of my favorite things to do in, in my own online instruction is to use metacognitive blogging in my instruction. And so my students are required to reflect on their learning in the course in a public blog. And they need to think about what they're learning, how they're learning, um, what is helping or hindering their learning, and they need to write about that. And, and I ask them things like, how do you know, what did you learn and how do you know you learned it? And how can you apply it? Those kinds of things. So I, I've provided a resource here that I've created to explain um, this concept or this, this activity of, of metacognitive reflection um, to help other instructors use it in their instruction so that they can um, you know, uh, uh, use this as one way to address some of those higher order um, thinking skills. Um, there's a lot here to go over, so um, I'm going to, I, like I said, you'll have the link to all of this. I, I actually post all of the different guiding questions um, that I ask my students so that you can see and, and um, use them and adapt them. Again, everything is, um, is uh, going to be linked to in the documentation for this presentation. Um, this particular standard 32 is about open educational resources, which I'm sure you are all um, familiar with. This standard is a little bit controversial here in New York, but we have an open um, educational resources initiative here in SUNY. And, um, and so we want to encourage um, that, and that faculty leverage these resources um, uh, in their online instruction where appropriate. And so that's why this standard is here. Uh, because the tool is openly licensed, if a particular campus uh, within our system or someone else outside you is using it and, and they don't happen to want to do this or, or you know, have some um, challenge or issue with this, it's very, very simple to just eliminate it from the rubric. Um, they can just hide the, um, uh, the row and then um, that then um, is eliminated from, uh, from their review. But it's something, the rubric that we've created has our point of view and our perspectives on a variety of things. Um, the main thing I want you to know is that it's customizable to your context and to your needs. Um, so that if there's a standard that you need to adjust in terms of the language or the text, you can do that. Um, if you need to eliminate a standard or add a standard, you can also do that. So interaction is a big um, set of standards, a, a big part of online instruction and, and um, courses in our model. 
Um, we don't have really self-paced courses and we don't really have huge, um, um, you know, large format courses. We have some, but, you know, not on your scale. And, and, um, and so um, interaction uh, and, and um, collaborative learning is a big part of our um, instruction. And so we want to make sure that um, faculty set timely and regular um, expectations for when uh, students are going to get feedback from their instructors, that those are clearly stated in the course, easily findable. Um, and um, we want to, um, um, th that project that I mentioned at the beginning was about regular and substantive interaction. And this is a site um, that is actually not public yet, but that describes um, some of the um, documentation and some of the legal um, um, language around this particular topic. Uh, and so I thought I would include it so that you could see um, exactly what, you know, we're um, we're focused on in terms of supporting and clearly articulating this notion of regular and substantive interaction. And here is another web page that we have with a variety of links and resources that describe um, what regular and substantive interaction um, entail. Um, this really is about making that clear to students. Um, you know, how they are going to get um, feedback and, and, and when and, and setting those expectations so that students know from the outset what they can expect. Um, all right, so um, this standard 42 is about course, uh, the course offering opportunities for learner to learner interaction and constructive collaboration. So this, um, this standard uh, um, some of the ideas that one could use to refresh their course um, for this standard would be to um, have learners moderate discussions, have them be the ones in charge of facilitating an online discussion. Um, another idea would be to have learners work in groups, um, to have a collaborative um, bookmarking site where students create a shared annotated bibliography of resources that support whatever assertions or assumptions they have in the course and share that with each other, to create um, collaborative writing projects, to do case studies, um, and so forth. So there's a lot of ideas that can be used. I have put together some um, documentation on um, designing cooperative learning um, uh, well and you know common mistakes and what to do about them, tips for successful uh, cooperative learning uh, online and then um, collaborative online small group work. It, it takes some work to set these up to be effective initially, uh, but once um, once they are set up and and you know the instructions have been, um, created and you thought through what you're having the students do. Um, these are fabulous types of activities that you can engage um, students in and of course they address this particular standard. Um, this um, Inside Higher Ed uh, article I thought was particularly good and about active learning um, and there are some um, really short suggestions here about how to engage your um, students and make the learning that you're doing more active, whether you're doing it in synchronous or asynchronous format. Um, so these were a bunch of good, really good um, suggestions and activities uh, that you could um, use. So I, so that's why I, I posted this here. I thought it was particularly, you know, succinct and, and well um, documented. So now this is the last um, uh, section um, of standards, and I've selected two here. Often faculty are um, very concerned about assessment and feedback uh, for, you know, obvious reasons. Um, I think um, I selected standard 45, course includes frequent and appropriate methods to assess learners' mastery of content. Of course, this is the stuff of an online course. This is the the you know, the meat of it, um, you know, you present content, you facilitate interaction and collaboration, and then you provide mechanisms for self-assessment, um, uh, um, assessment and evaluation to make sure that the students got out of it what you were intending them to, to get out of the activity. Um, so, um, um, 
let's see here, this first one, um, you want to um, focus on designing authentic online assessments and so you know our context may be different here in part because of the the smaller nature of the courses um you know some of our campuses do use proctoring um tools and do use um testing centers and um and have requirements uh for that uh but in general we um advocate um making sure that any assessments that you design are appropriate for the scope and scale um, and, and the objectives of, of the instruction. Um, and so, you know, on a smaller scale, um, you want to, um, you know, if you do a, a, a midterm and a final, and these are multiple choice tests, you know that, the, that, that these tests are open book um, and, um, you know, take home and potentially collaborative in nature. And so those are not really authentic um, um, online assessments uh, necessarily because of that. Um, so you want to try and think about, you know, what your objective is, what the way it is that you are achieving that objective, and then design activities that will allow you to appropriately and authentically assess what's going on from the individual learner perspective. And so you want to break complex projects down into smaller components, for example, and provide feedback at each step. You want to use rubrics to articulate and provide expectations uh, that are detailed. You want to consider self-assessments so that you can help learners check their own understanding. And you want to incorporate perhaps self and peer assessments to help them understand um, their own, um, to deepen their own understanding. Um, and, and this will also assist you in being more effective and more efficient in terms of workload. Um, so I've provided, I've gathered and provided a bunch of resources to um, share with you about this particular standard. One are, is this one, the, these alternatives to traditional um, testing. Uh, to really rethink, um, you know, if you're typically using um, um, tests, um, either midterms that are high stakes or finals that are high stakes, you want to consider some alternatives. You might want to consider some alternatives to that. And this resource has a whole bunch of suggestions that I thought were particularly good. Um, I also have um, some online assessment techniques that are also um, similar. Many of these sort of have um, you know, varying perspectives on similar ideas. Um, and so this gives a description of how you would do it online and then what to do with it. Um, and then I have some resources on rubrics and these top five rubrics here, I think are particularly good models. Um, and there are a whole bunch of rubrics on this page that you can use for a variety of types of uh, activities. Um, and so that you can see what they look like. And I am a huge advocate of the use of rubrics. They really make expectations transparent to the, to the student and make um, the, the assessment of the activities much more efficient and effective from the perspective of the instructor. Here's some more information about the use of rubrics and some examples. Of, of various types of rubrics for various types of purposes, various types of activities. Uh, and so I want to encourage you to come back and review these resources when you have some time to, to dig in. Um, of course, supporting academic honesty is, um, is very important um, to all of us to make sure that we're not, in fact, um, um, making it easy for students to cheat or make putting students in the position where they feel that's an option. And so um, we have a variety of types of approaches to think about how to address um, um, you know, technology enhanced cheating. And really in, in some ways it's about, it, it can be mitigated with the design um, of, of, the, of the activity in many, many ways. Um, this article I like particularly well because it was succinct. There's 14 strategies to, um, uh, you know, to make uh, um, things a little bit less easy um, in terms of cheating. Um, 
All right. And then for me, I, I don't really like focusing on cheating. I don't assume students are going to cheat. And I do my very, very best to make sure that students um, will engage in productive activities and that they have engaging activities in which to explore the course concepts. And I think about things much more from this perspective, this, the perspective of supporting online student success. And so I wanted to finish off this particular standard with that focus, with that lens. Um, um, I think that it is very easy to, perhaps very easy to go down the road of just assuming that everyone is going to cheat. And, and, and I prefer to think about it as I would like to support my online learner's success. And so th these are a bunch of things that you can do as an instructor to, um, to support the success of your online students. And I've highlighted a few that I think are, are important. And this tool is based in research and the research is on self-regulated learning strategies. And I have adapted them for, for online. Um, and, and this notion of um, self-efficacy and, and self student or learner self-regulation, I think are particularly important if you're interested in the theory behind this. And then I have posted this from another lens, from the student lens, about what they need to be successful as an online student. And so, um, you know, goal setting and planning and, and I'm sure that you all know many of these things, but I have this all posted in, in, in kind of a clear way from both of these lenses, from the student lens as well as from the faculty lens with some theory so that you can kind of take a look at that and see how you are supporting your own online student success in your own online courses. Standard 50, this is the last standard. Um, I think multiple um, providing op multiple opportunities to provide descriptive feedback in the course um, is uh, really important. So to, to end a course, you as the instructor and as the last learner um, yourself in the course want to understand your your um, students' um, um, experience from their perspective. This is not a course evaluation. This is really intended to ask students what their experience was like so that you can improve your own design of your course and your own instructional approaches, your own facilitation of the course. And so to do that, you can't just say, how did you like the course? You have to ask some more um, you know, deep and, and some probing questions. And so um, you know, um, asking, uh, what did you like best? What um, what do you think could be improved in the design? Um, how would you improve the quality and participation in interactions? Um, what do you, what would you suggest about pacing? Um, what would you suggest uh, uh, about the required amount of work? Um, what would you suggest about um, how the course was facilitated? And what other suggestions would you have? So I have a bunch of questions here that you can um, look at and adapt um, to really get at what students' experience was. And I do this as a culminating activity in my course. It's a, it's a, it, I, I ask them to, to answer these questions. And then when I go to review and revise my own course, I look at their responses and I make decisions about what I'm gonna try and improve um, informed by the, the students' perspectives. Um, so I also, this is just kind of a little bit of a bonus. I, I collect um, s feedback and, and suggestions from my students um, that I use for future students in the course. So this is a tool called Padlet. And I just ask them, if you had some advice for future students in this course, what would it be? And I, I, I embed this into my course so they don't have to actually go out of the course in order to do it. But you know, then once they have given their feedback to the future students of the course, I then put this at the beginning of my the next time I teach the course, so that um, you know the new students can see what the the students who have most recently completed the course had to say about the course. Um, all right, so that is pretty much what I have in terms of um, you know going over the Oscar. Um, um, the tour and the demonstration of the tools and 
the discussion or, or the highlighting of specific standards. Um, before we close out, I wanna make sure that you know that you are invited to join um, our community to continue this conversation by becoming a friend of SUNY, by joining our online networking group and by joining the Oscar user group if you're interested. Um, and then I also, um, want to make sure that you can see that the URL for Oscar is there and that the materials for these um, for this presentation, all of the links I've showed, as well as this uh, PowerPoint are available at that URL. And then I want to make sure also that if you would be interested in earning some badges for having participated in this presentation, you can earn the Friend of SUNY badge and you have already earned um, the introduction to Oscar uh, Oscar badge. And in order to um, uh, to do this, you would need to fill out this form in order to become a friend of SUNY. You would need to join the online networking group. You would need to then join the Oscar user group. You'd need to create um, a Credly um, account. The Credly is the badging platform we use. And these are our badges. This is our badging, um, you know, uh, the center for where we put all of our badges. This is the Friend of SUNY badge that you can earn. And then it's shareable in LinkedIn or in Twitter or Facebook, wherever you happen to, you, whatever social media you happen to use. And this is the, um, the, the badge that you've earned by completing this introduction to Oscar. Um, if you actually would like to earn badges for this, the way that the only way that I can do that is to issue those badges to you. So you'll need to fill out this form, um, and then I can issue you your your friend of SUNY badge and your workshop badge, your intro to Oscar badge. Um, this is my um, website for my unit. Um, and this is an online teaching gazette that I put out. Um, every month that you might be interested in. And now I am ready to take some questions. And I think I went a little bit over time, <laughs> but I am That's ready fine. for some That's questions. That's fine, Alex. Thank you very, very much, Alex, for an excellent presentation. Uh, it's so much of information you've given us. I'm wondering how we now filter all that in because it's been on point to where we are at, in, at the institution. And I think you've really taken us from right from step one to step 50 in that, in that sense of where we need to be as an institution. Uh, I'm gonna open up the floor for questions, but before I do that, I'm gonna ask uh, Prof. Mashile first to just share a few words. And then I've also asked uh, Dr. Gavinder, who is the Director of Curriculum Development and Transformation to also share a brief response on his side as well. So let me ask Prof. Mashile first. Prof, the floor is yours. Uh, Prof. Mashile, the floor is yours. I think you just need to unmute. Okay, while Prof. Mashile is coming back online, I think he's trying to unmute. Maybe I can ask uh, Dr. Gowans. Devin, the floor is yours then. Maybe you can give a quick response. Thank you, Program Director. I'm not sure if I'm audible. Yep, you're good to go. You're good to go. Thank you very much, sir. Uh, firstly, I think let me convey our sincere thanks to Alex for such an informative presentation that leaves us with so many questions in, in terms of our response and addressing various quality matters in terms of online teaching and learning. But Alex, let me first begin uh, with your question, which was why. And I think that's an important one uh, to locate within one's teaching and learning philosophy. Uh, personally, I believe in order for fully, to fully subscribe to the methodology, to the structure, to the uh, content, to the innovation in online teaching and learning, one has to review and revise the current teaching and learning philosophy, because that will answer the why question. And I think for far too long, instructional designers, academics, as you 
point out and even to an extent administrators have not partnered following a systems approach to understand the value and significance of working in a team approach uh, in so far as online teaching and learning is concerned. Uh, Alex, we are slightly fortunate at UNISA because we have what is called a framework for a team approach to curriculum design and development, and it serves as a framework within which we design and develop uh, curricula, so to speak. But I would be the first to point out that in so far as adopting fully online teaching and learning at UNISA from 2021 beyond, that there are many policies that probably we have to revisit and relook. I think the first one is our current minimum standards for online teaching and learning. Uh, from your presentation, it has become clear that the various gaps that we have to address and respond to in our current minimum standards for online teaching and learning. Uh, secondly, Alex, I think uh, we are currently grappling with the whole debate and discourse around assessment. Uh, from 2020, uh, we have moved to what we call integrated assessment, which is underpinned by continuous assessment. And I took a keen interest when you shared under uh, quality standard 45, those 14 strategies, uh, I think, on how to address, in inverted commas, cheating. We use the term proctoring like as a term, uh, you know, to address uh, dishonesty and so forth, I, whether it's on assessment, uh, whether it's on active learning or whatever the case is, using an online teaching and learning presence. So we're busy investigating particular software uh, some colleges at UNISA is using IRIS as a proctoring solution. And uh, the success of that, I'm not in a position to highlight. Uh, thirdly, Alex and colleagues, uh, the issue of content authoring tools. I'm not sure if uh, at the end you want to share with us whether you are solely dependent on the built-in content authoring tool in Moodle, or do you all have some plug-in solutions? The next point, Alex, I think even in the chat, just as a ballpark, just as a rough idea, if you want to share with us, how long does it take to design and develop a fully online module? At UNISA, we are afforded, you know, anything between nine to 14 months in a development cycle to develop a fully online module. So I thought we really appreciate it if you can perhaps share your experience. Uh, Alex, I can go on and on, but because of time, I want to be as succinct as possible. And therefore, let me conclude uh, by posing the following uh, clarification. Look so, at UNISA. So, sorry. So look at UNISA, just as a final point, uh, you know, we as far as possible uh, implement universal design for learning principles. We have done that with some success in blended learning, but we also want to learn on how you know, we transition these principles in fully online teaching and learning. Program director, with that, uh, I conclude, as I said, because of time purposes. Thank you very much for the opportunity. Thank you. Thanks, Dr. Kavan. Much appreciated. Alex, the floor is yours. And while the floor, while you take the floor, may I ask Richard to 
uh, quickly open up the mics for the other colleagues so that we can also get questions from them. Thanks, Alex. The floor is yours. So um, thank you for for that summary and 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 comments. Um, um, the last one that I remember had to do with the amount of time it takes to, uh, to fully develop a course. And the last time we were actually able to study this, we estimated um, that uh, that um, our faculty were taking um, a hundred and uh, an average of 120 hours to develop an online course. And we did this one semester in advance of the delivery of the course. And so it would be, you know, we would start in um, in May for uh, fall delivery, and we would start in December for spring delivery. Um, and um, fall starts in September, and spring starts in uh, January. So, um, in our model, faculty design their own courses. They they work with an instructional designer. Um, they go through training. They have opportunities to observe other online courses. They have opportunities to be introduced to Oscar and to quality standards formatively. So it's not a surprise to them at the end of their course development that they get reviewed. They, they understand the standards from the first day and they have an opportunity to be in the seat of an online student um, first before they ever talk touch the technology so that they can really have that firsthand experience of what it's like to be a participant in an online asynchronous discussion and be a student in, in a course so that they have that perspective when they go to design their own courses. So 120 hours was the average that we, um, that we got as self-reported time from our faculty. And this is huge numbers of faculty that we, uh, that we polled. And, um, and what we learned also from that is the more amount of time that an instructor put into the design of their course, the higher their satisfaction and their higher their perception of the learning of their students. Um, and, and then what we, we then also polled students, studied students, and the higher numbers of hours reported by the instructor that they put into the course, the higher the students um, satisfaction and the higher the students reported learning. Uh, so that's what I can say about that. I think it's going to be dependent on your model. We have one institution within SUNY that kind of uses a um, um, like a master course model where they're where the people who develop the course are not the people who actually teach the course. That's Empire State College, which you may be familiar with or have heard of. Um, and that is unique among in our 64 institutions. Um, many of our campuses now quick start faculty into their course designs with templates um, that have been um, um, adapted from, uh, you know, a centrally designed template. Um, to meet the needs and contexts of the individual institutions. And with a template like that, faculty can be quick started into the design, um, the effective design of an online course. And, um, and of course, you know, it, it, it's, there's a lot of flexibility in our design. We provide templates, um, but they're not locked down. Faculty can modify those designs and, and take things out or change things. Um, we work very hard to make sure that faculty understand why consistency is important um, across um, a program, across the institution, and across the system. But in our climate, in our in our context, cult culturally, in, in terms of the, the institution, we can't legislate or mandate anything. So, um, so. What I have found, though, is that if we provide a template, if we provide rationale that is research based and explanations of how this is better for the student, better for the faculty, better for the institution, faculty are, are you know, not they're likely to not make changes that are substantive to, to the sort of navigation and flow of the wrapper around the content. Obviously, the content of the course is the entire purview of the instructor. They are the the um, uh, instructor of record and academic freedom from our context, um, uh, you know, does not step on that at all. <laughs> they, they are in charge of, of how the content is designed and delivered and facilitated. Um, you know, I wanted to end kind of by saying, um, 
you know, I, I wanted to try an activity with you if everyone would indulge me and, and, and try this out to make my final point. Um, and this is called a chat storm. And this is a pedagogical device that you can use in, in synchronous instruction if you like. And I'm gonna try it here if you, if you would like to. Um, my question to you is, um, well, the way this works is I'll pose a question and then you type your answer in the chat and don't send it until I say send. And then when I say send, everybody puts it in the chat and you see it all at once. So my question to you is, what is the single most important thing about quality in an online course, in an online course, course design, course instruction? What is the single most important thing? Now type your answer in the chat, but don't send it until I say oh, go. Okay, I'm gonna say go in the interest of time. Go, press enter and let's see what happens. Excellent. OK, um, so I love all of these different um, perspectives, all these different ideas. You can see everything from um, instructional design, quality assurance, communication, trust, um, clarity. Um, the student is the most important thing. Um, um, uh, content accuracy, um, uh, consistency, um, learner success, planning, all of these things are important. Um, Molato said, uh, let me see if I can find what he said, um, that it's all of our responsibilities. And I guess you know, from my perspective, I would always say instructional design, since that is the, the thing that is nearest and dearest to my heart with my instructional designer hat on. But, you know, with my my larger, um, 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 you know, view, my larger perspective, um, there is not one thing that is responsible for quality in, in um, the design, in, in online education. All of us play a role. Um, and the quality of, um, our, of our online course is dependent on all of the roles represented here um, in this presentation from administrators to directors of various units um, to faculty to people who support faculty to the learners themselves. It is really something that is in important that and and if any one of those things is out of sync or out of whack then it affects quality um you know the technology has to be robust there have to be resources in place to to support um all of the different activities um, um and and so there is it's not just about faculty development and it's not just about instructional design um, it takes a village. It takes all of us together from all of our various perspectives to ensure that um, that quality exists and is continuously improved um, across all of the different aspects that touch faculty and courses in an online teaching and learning environment. And so that is, you know, my final um, you know words of of uh, of advice and of wisdom, if they are. Um, to and, and I'd so appreciate all of your engagement and, and your um, indulgence in this um, final activity and in the kind um, words and questions. I posted all of the links in the chat. I hope I know that the session is being recorded and I hope this, that the chat goes with it so that you can get all the links um, and that you can continue to look through these resources, some of which are very um, uh, you know, that will take some time to digest and, and absorb. 
And I hope that we can continue this conversation, that we will be able to continue to connect across the ocean um, um, and, and be connected in our um, enthusiasm for online teaching and learning and our, um, and our um, commitment to um, addressing and thinking about the issue of continuous online improvement from the perspective of the instructional design of courses, the teaching of courses, and the administration of courses. Um, one final thought is that Oscar is one piece of that pie, right? It only looks at the instructional design of a course. It does not look at the teaching of the course, and, and it certainly does not address the robustness of the technology, the resources that are available, the models that are implemented, and all of the other categories of types of things that affect quality that we just kind of outlined with this uh, chat bomb, chat storm thing that we did. So with that, I will say thank you to Denzil and to um, uh, the whole team there uh, for your time and attention and all the participants. I see Alice Goodman Davey. Hi. Um, and, um, and I just thank you all for your time and for your attention. Thank you very, very much, Alex. Uh, colleagues, I know we are over time, but we will get Alex back again. I've already negotiated with her for come back for more sessions. So we definitely want you back, Alex, to do more sessions with us and unpack a little bit more of that. Uh, I see this. The, we, I think we'll continue the conversation via uh, by the chat and also when we meet next time. Uh, in the interest of time, I don't know it's way after five o'clock, so I don't keep colleagues too late. Uh, at this time, I'm not too sure if Prof. Mashila is still with us. Prof, are you still with us? Yes, I'm still here. Oh, yes. Thanks, Prof. Do you want to have a closing remark before I ask uh, Ingrid to do vote of thanks? Okay, yes, no, thank you. I really uh, uh, appreciate the, uh, the the presentation, uh, uh, Alex. I really, um, I think I think you took us through um, a, a, a detailed um, uh, expose in terms of uh, the kind of uh, development work uh, that uh, we need to 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 look at when we are thinking about uh, embedding quality um, uh, in, the, in, the, in the development process. And uh, as we proceed uh, with uh, uh, online um, uh, teaching uh, at scale, um, uh, these things that you, uh, that you mentioned, the, the terrain that you covered, um, really will um, uh, make us, all of us, to pause and to uh, really uh, engage with this, with this, with this process. Um, as we indicated in the uh, introduction, um, we, we are in uh, 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 an interesting time with the, the pandemic uh, upon us. Um, and so whatever we could do to uh, enhance the learning experience of, of students, to make life of students a little bit better, we really uh, appreciate it, and we we really um, uh, are grateful that you have indicated willingness to be able to continue uh, engaging with us uh, in this journey. Uh, thank you very much, and thank you, uh, colleagues, for, for 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 attending. Thank you uh, for all the participation in the chats and the questions and the input. We really uh, appreciate it. Uh, appreciate it, and and thank you, uh, program director. Um, and the team that is organizing the, the ADVO um, uh, uh, presentations, we, we really uh, are grateful uh, of these uh, initiatives that will really, I think, keep us at UNISAM uh, on the cutting edge. Thank you very much. And back to you, uh, Program Director. Thanks, Prof. Appreciate those closing words and uh, those words of inspiration as well. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, at this time, colleagues, I'll just ask Ingrid to do a final vote of thanks, and then we can round up. Ingrid. Thank you very much, Denzel. Um, Alex, thank you very much. This was really, really interesting, and I really appreciated um, the passion with which you spoke about something that I think often some people might find um, not the most exciting of topics, but I, I, I think you, you came in with, with really um, practical experience and suggestions, and I really love the idea 
um, that that you framed this as a process that is not just the once off to be engaged with uh, now and again, but 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 something that 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 everyone can um, start now, start small, and continually do. And I really appreciated your very positive framing of some of the issues that we grapple with. For example, academic honesty and things. So thank you very much. I hope you have a very lovely summer's day there in New York. Um, and until we meet again. Thank you so much. It's very hot here. Very hot. <laughs> sure. Thanks. Thanks, Ingrid. Thanks, Alex, once again. Uh, I really appreciate that. And thank you to all the colleagues for joining us, Prof. Mashir, Dr. Governor, and the rest of the colleagues for joining us inside UNISA, as well as those that came out from other universities. Thank you very, very much, and we look forward for your continued support to the ADO project and our the developments at UNISA. And uh, we pray that you all have a blessed uh, evening and please stay safe, especially within this COVID time. So once again, thank you, everybody, and goodbye, and God bless you. Thanks, Alex. Again. Thank you. Please stop the recording.